What's happening guys? Today I am in Santa Cruz County at the United States Mexico border. Today I'm going to be meeting up with the sheriff of Santa Cruz County. Yeah, and hey, he's super. going to be showing us around today. <laughs> Yeah, so, thanks for coming down. Thank you for having me. Are you a native of Arizona? Yeah, my family's been here for five generations since the 1800s, since before Arizona became a state. Arizona became a state in 1912, and this house behind it is where my dad was born, and there were seven boys in that family, seven brothers. Um, this Now, this house has been added on to over the years. It was just used to be a little shack, but there's been various additions on it over the years. We're a ranching family. We have ranch property in two counties, in Santa Cruz County, where we are here, and in Cochise County, which is to the east. Awesome, can you show us around? Sure. This is amazing property. How many acres does this sit on? Um, there's different par parcels, you know, it, it, within the family, it adds up to a few thousand. That's our dog named Jill right there. Hey there. What's up, buddy? You all right? <laughs> Yeah, like I said, this house has been added on to over the years, so it's beyond what it was my, it, it is my aunt and uncle's house. My uncle uh, died recently, and so uh, this is the original house where the family started out in. It's interesting to wind this thing like it has a little key. It's all mechanical, it's weights. Like you do this, and this weight here, watch it'll go up. Uh, See it go up? And then as that weight falls down, I gotta start this again. As that weight falls down, it operates the mechanism, the little gears, so it's like, you know, all mechanical, no batteries or anything like that. It's just ah. kind of neat how it works with these weights that maybe you wind it once every five days when the weight gets down low, you just crank it and then it goes back up. Just rocks that were picked up off the ranch to use to make that fireplace there and it has a little uh, greenhouse area over here I'll show you like normally down here you can't grow citrus to your trees because it's higher elevation than Phoenix I thought that it would possibly be warmer here you know it's it seems illogical because you're going closer to the equator right mm -hmm. so you think you're going south it ought to be hotter but you're gaining elevation, so it's actually cooler. We get more rain, it's greener here. Mm -hmm. Like the, yeah. the water in the fish pond was frozen this morning, well, but it'll get up to maybe low 70s today, but it gets down to the 20s and 30s okay. at night. It's that big temperature swing because the air is thinner, higher elevation, so it's, it gets cooler at night, but it warms up pretty quick. Usually down here, eh, we have a good rainy season, better than Tucson or Phoenix. We usually get good rain from late June, all the way up through halfway through September. Mm -hmm. And so it greens up good and it's good cattle country. Uh, typically there's plenty of grass for the cattle. Trees grow down here and uh, so, you know, a lot of mesquite trees here. And then some of our property up in the mountains, there's oak trees and pine trees and, and juniper trees. But yeah, it gets a lot more rain down here than it does up in Phoenix. So if you ever want to escape the heat, you come down here and it's going to be in the summer like 15 degrees cooler than uh -huh. it is. Like it rarely, gets 100 here in the summer. That's awesome. So we're up a little bit. Yeah, that's a, there's something on there, a grapefruit. So that, yeah, they actually grow. Now, if, the, if it wasn't indoors, it wouldn't grow here. Like in Phoenix, they would grow, cause, but it's just too cold down here. They would freeze and they would die. Uh, the citrus just can't stay alive here, but indoors like that, it does okay. If you're, smelling the gingerbread in the air. That's what my wife's doing today. She's <laughs> cooking, uh, making gingerbread houses, laying out the, making the dough, laying it out, cutting out the little templates and then baking the things. And then tomorrow, some cousins and some other lady friends are gonna come over and make gingerbread houses with her. Now, are all your children, are they all older? Adult? Uh, we got one living at home, 16, but of the nine children, They've all moved on. We always had the dream that all our kids would live near us, but life's not that way, you know. Wow. That's and there's so nice, a pool, pool room down here, a pool table. Sheriff, this is a nice setup. <laughs> and then 
If you're up for it, before we start the border tour, I'm gonna go throw some vegetables to the chickens that are right out back in the chicken coop. You know, here's the, the garage in here. This just goes on and on and on. And then there's another bedroom suite here. This is like a fold down, like, I think they call these things like a Murphy bed. That's a fold down bed. And here's another uh, bedroom suite in here. Nice. But anyway, I mean, it's mostly empty. It's just me and my wife and one of our sons for now. So we got, there's like this, uh, an arbor thing. I think that's what they call it, where you, there's like an outdoor seating area there. And then it's got those vines growing over it and stuff. So you can kind of go out there in the summer and it has one of those misting things where, I don't know. You didn't grow up in this house. No, uh, my mom's house is just down the road from here. And my dad's passed away now, and she's just there by herself. That's the house I grew up in. But this was my uncle's house, and my dad, when he grew up before that, it was, so it was my grandpa's house originally. It is so unique that you grew up like this. You guys are five generations yeah. here, and all your family lived on this property. Um, quite a few of them, and quite a few have moved away, Tucson, Phoenix, and, and whatnot. But my uncle still lives next door. My mom's down the road. My son has a house next door here and like i said we kind of hope the kids would stay around but it looks like you know maybe there's not too many work opportunities down here yeah. so they go they meet people and get married and you know how kids are them. how we are when you grow up and you, i'm go, i'm getting away from here or exactly. whatever the case well like when i grew up here me and my wife went to public school together and i met her when she was 10 years old and i was 12 years old like right now i'm 64 and she's 62 but back then it's right. Everybody's like, man, I'm going to get out of this dirt water town. I'm going to go make something out of myself. But then later on, people realize, you know what? The weather's pretty nice here. The people are calm, you know, and it's peaceful. And then a lot of people move back later on. But as far as like jobs and stuff, it's not like Phoenix where there's more job opportunities. Yeah. Like that. Once they get older, they're going to get away from the rat race and all the big city crap. They're going to bring the kids back. Yep. They're going to get tired of that $2,700 apartment and just think, you know what? The way I grew up out on the ranch, a lot of open space, peaceful, calm, go take a walk in the evening. I think at some point that'll it, click. Yeah. It'll kick in, it'll <laughs> kick in. And these little crocheted animals, my wife makes those. She's made tons of them. Like I have a whole collection. Like that's a llama and that's a little donkey with a pack saddle. I'm amazed how she does it. I look at like the fine little stitches and I think there's no way I could make a straight line like that and have it all come out good. She just does it all by hand with a little crochet. Yeah, brush. she definitely took it to the next level. Now you were saying that you still feed chickens. Yeah, I mean, I it's kind of relaxing for me to do the the ranch type stuff, you know, I like going and uh, cutting firewood and just working on the wells and the pipelines and things like that, fixing the fences or, you know, like cutting firewood, you know, out there with a chainsaw and stuff like that. So that's actually very relaxing for me to do the ranch stuff, you know, go feed the chickens and stuff. Playroom for the kids back here doesn't really get used because there's not the young people around. But this, this house is mainly empty, just me and my wife and our 16 year old son, but there's a lot of people that have lived here over the years and just there's a lot of family. Yep. There are various bedrooms like here's, I think this back hallway has maybe four or five bedrooms. This place is enormous. Man. You just kept uh, adding on to it. Well, this was my uncle's house and then he passed away. So how many kids on. did he have? Uh, five. Are eight. you Mormon? No, there are. Mormons in this area and, and probably up where you are too, but no. I don't know if Karen's making food for us or something. She, <laughs> some food appeared here. <laughs> um, and she says, do you want a cheeseburger? Sure. I'll take a cheeseburger. <laughs> You guys like all organic no. kind of folks like no. you? You don't process your own cattle no, not, and all that deal? Not now. We maybe would be if I wasn't the sheriff, but I'm just... Um, busy on that now. Maybe we go back to that when I'm done doing the sheriff stuff because it just, you know, it's too much to focus on all the animals and stuff. There's all the chickens out there and then I, we get here in Nogales all this free fruits and vegetables because over half of the fruits and vegetables that come into the U.S. come in through this town and there's always a lot of free stuff and they like to give it away rather than throw it away when they have excess. So you'll see when I open the garage door here. 
this is what we have now. We just use it for our chickens, which kind of feels like a waste, but if we don't get it, they just throw it in the dump. Like you see, I got all these cases of watermelons and then we get, and that's honeydew and we had a bunch of cantaloupe. These are all green beans. Mm -hmm. And like I say, we're, the produce companies, they get excess and they try to time it for the market so it's ripe when it gets to New York or wherever it's going. And some of them they look at and they say, well, it's ripe now, ready to eat now, but it's not gonna make it or they just get excess. We got all this for free yesterday. I get it every week and we just get it for the chickens. While we're in here, Super, I'm just gonna show you this guest house. It's just a, another house that nobody's using now. Not, Nice little house, one bedroom. It's got the fireplace and the, the kitchen and the nice patio out there. And it's got a little nice. brick bar barbecue. And and right now we're using it to, just using the garage to shore, store all the vegetables for the chickens. Here's the bedroom in here. If you peek out the back window here, you can see the little brick barbecue over there in the corner. So it'd be a nice little place, peaceful place to live, just back up here in the boonies with no neighbors or anything like that. I like all the patios off of the bedrooms that you have. You have them everywhere, all over the place. Yeah, like it's, the weather's pretty nice year round down here, so it's good for doing things outdoors, so. And so. chickens eat uh, watermelon, huh? Yeah, they'll eat, they, they'll kind of eat everything, you know, kind of like pigs and stuff, pigs and goats. I'll push them right here and then you can just go in. Ooh, get out. Just kind of a shame for this stuff to go to waste, so we just pick it up instead of letting them throw it away. And you can get as much as you want. You can come down here with a dump truck and get all the watermelon, green beans, mangoes. Okay, I guess that's it for the chickens. Our water looks okay, Karen, so that'll do it. Are they liking those green beans? If we wanted to. We I don't just know, I think they're gonna pass them the green beans <laughs> versus the <laughs> versus that watermelon. <laughs> well, I guess, Karen, we're gonna hop in the car now and right. go look at the border. What about those uh, vigilante groups? Are they out here? There are people that'll come to the border thinking they're going to find some action. Like we had a rancher here that had been writing fan fiction on Amazon and he was describing himself hunting migrants wow. with his AK-47. And he actually even used his own name and his wife's name and his ranch's name. And he came from somewhere else. And then we caught him out there actually shooting at some people out there, shooting at some migrants. Wow. Killed one of them, and one of them got away. So now he's being prosecuted for homicide in the county. So that's an example of a guy with that mentality. They come out here, and they want to say, I'm out here in the Wild West, and they want to have a big, tough story to tell. I'm going to go out there and hunt me some Mexicans, you know? And, uh. and they, that appeals to some people, but it's not a common thing. It's like, I mean, you would just be driving around. He's and, an extremist. Yeah, you would not see people like that. It's not like there's a bunch of groups wandering around with that attitude. Well, are you ready to hit the road and go look at the border? All right, yes, sir. And just push it again to stop it. And then that's another type. Pull over to the right. Yeah, there you go. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, man. You got it down. You even got that authoritarian sounding voice. Yeah, I switched up real quick, huh? Now I'm going to pause up here on this curve so you can see all these hills back here that are part of the ranch just while we're up here high. They're kind of... That's all part of the ranch. This is where I grew up. 
milking the cows. I'd go find the cows every morning in this past year and bring them in and milk them before I went to school. Go to school with my boots all muddy and everything and then come back and do it again in the evening and then me and my dad would go work on the ranch at night. Wow. I mean, like on the weekends. But it's really pretty country and especially in the summer it, when, it, when it rains it gets so green and nice. This little school here, my dad went to this school, I went to this school, and my grandfather was the first superintendent. It wasn't all this big stuff, it was just that one little building on the right. And I would walk to school every day to this school when I was a kid. One of those bronze plaques to the left of the door is my grandfather. William Hathaway has a plaque with him there as the first school superintendent. When I went there and my dad went there was just that one little red building. But now they've added all this other stuff in recent years. Wow. And, well, well, let me ask you a question, Super. That 100,000 subscriber plan, <laughs> are people just pawing all over that and begging to see that thing? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, feel free to brag. I know you're a modest guy. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought that was impressive. You did the unboxing video. <laughs> that nice mirror reflection, that play button. So look at look you're being modest, man. I, I want to see that thing. Someday. That thing was something, man. To me, you know, <laughs> to me it was something no one else cares. Yeah, no, about I love that video. You're talking about all the records you broke. You know, <laughs> the oldest this, the youngest that, <laughs> the first one. Man, that was so funny. Me and my wife were, well, well, wife were just laughing at that. That was that was a good video. Uh, don't go looking it up, man. Just take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the road we're going on here is kind of paralleling the road we're on, but we're on the other side of the river. This is the Santa Cruz River, so now we're going to go up to the part of the border where there's no fence. There's just nothing. There's no fence or anything, but I'm going to go show you a part where you can see kind of two types of fences. There was a type that was put up when Trump was president, and then there was the way it was before that. It used to be, when I was a kid, just a little four strand barbed wire fence like a cattle fence mm -hmm. when I grew up and you could just you know duck under the fence and go into Mexico and you can still do that now. Is that illegal to do? Well technically like say you're a U.S. citizen um, let's say you walked across into Mexico okay that's not illegal but they do have a crime in the U.S. called illegal entry and what that is that you're supposed to come back through a designated port of entry and they've changed the rules during my life to where you're supposed to have a passport now to come back from Mexico. When I was a kid, well, up until I was maybe in my mid-20s, me and my wife just go to Mexico and then you just walk back in and you just say, I'm a U.S. citizen and they let you in because they can't deny you admission to your own country. They can't tell you you can't come back to the United States if you're a U.S. citizen. But what they do now is they say, you have to go through a designated port of entry and get inspected and show your documents. So yeah, technically it is a crime if you came in from Mexico and you just walked, or walked through the fence, even if you're an American. I don't know if they would ever prosecute anybody for that if you were an American. They'd, they'd probably, the prosecutor probably wouldn't care enough to prosecute you. Now, that law that you were just telling me about, with a uh, hundred miles of the border, you can pull people over. There's an agency for any called reason. agency called Border Patrol, and now they're called CBP, Customs and Border Protection. But they still have an agency called the Border Patrol, and the Supreme Court has said that they, not me, that they can stop and deter and search and detain and interrogate anybody within 100 miles of the U.S. international border, and the Supreme Court has called that extended border search authority. But the problem with that is two-thirds of Americans, like we have about 340 million people in the U.S. now, so two-thirds of those, over 200 million people, live within that zone, that zone where the feds can pull you over and search you with no probable cause, no, no, no reason. Wow. So that would include cities like Chicago, New York, Miami, Los Angeles, Seattle, El Paso, Houston, uh, New Orleans. They're all within 100 miles of the international boundary. So to me, it's a real problem to have a policy like that within the U.S. government because we're supposed to be American. This is supposed to be a free country, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you shouldn't have people who can just pull you over for no reason like they're the Gestapo or something like that. So for me, that's a problem.
that's Mexico right there. And it's like, you see, it's just peaceful. There's nothing going on here. It's safe. And if you go down into the canyon right there, there's no fence at all. But like right here, you can just walk under that and that's Mexico. And you see that little pillar there, that white monument? That's a border monument when they surveyed the border. That's a survey marker to show here's the international border with Mexico. If you can see that, it says boundary of the United States right, right there. Yeah. Boundary of the United States. And it says by treaty established by the treaties of something, 18 something. You know, take me where the invasion is, where the hordes are, and I go, well, I can take you where there's no fence. Like, here's where that fence ended, and here's what was here before, and where you can just duck under it. I see, you're not going to see anything. Of all the many times, probably 100 times, that I've taken media people here from all the national media where they want to go see it, I'm like, you're just going to hear the wind blowing and the birds chirping. People have tried to make it into a political thing like Democrat versus Republican, but you had record numbers of entries during both Democrat presidents and Republican presidents. Like there was um, a 24 year period where there was over a million people apprehended at the Southwest border. And it was practically every year in the 80s and the 90s and 2000s with Republican presidents and Democrat presidents. The last 12 months of census data shows that the U.S. is growing at the slowest rate in its history. Where the river floods, it's usually just nothing here where you can just walk into Mexico. Um, right yeah. here, this was nothing there, no barrier. Yeah, just nothing at all. Like, um, And usually so that the ranchers can return cattle to Mexico that get into this country and so the ranchers in Mexico can return them to the U.S. They usually keep a spot where they can open up the fence. If they get through, um, the ranchers on this side will return them to Mexico and then vice versa. Yeah, last time I was here, it was open there in the bottom. Get one of the posts out of the way and just put your cattle through. But anyway, that's it. And then there's the, that other style of fence that was put up in the Trump era. But that's only near the city. Like if you go farther out of town towards those mountains, there's just no fence over there. Is that fence keeping us safe? <laughs> yeah, you can see all the terrorists right here that are trying to attack us. And as you can tell, if people want to come in, it's easy to come in. Once they're on US soil, like say somebody walked through there right here, the fence, it can be, I'm on the US, U.S. soil, I claim asylum. When they get in the U.S., they're scheduled for a future hearing. But a lot of times that's years down the road, so they can get a hearing to see their asylum case, to see whether they're going to get documents. So it's kind of a weird system. What I think they should do, like when my phone rang a while ago, and I, that was an NBC reporter asking me about uh, what needs to be done here. Uh, do we need more immigration judges at the border? And that's what I always say instead of just deferring these things forever, instead of just creating an endless list of future hearings that are years down the road, why don't you just have the immigration judges right on the border and the people line up and they present their documents. If the answer is yes, it's yes. If it's no, it's no. Rather than just assigning them to some future um, hearing. And, and here's a, a weird thing, Super. Depend on where you say you're going. If you cross here and you say, I'm going to New York, New York City has a backlog of eight years on their hearings, on their asylum hearings. So if you say your destination is New York, you're not even gonna get a hearing date until eight years into the future. So it's basically you're allowed in for a future hearing that's gonna be years down the road. And then they go wherever they go and they're probably working on a farm or an apple orchard in Southern Illinois or something like that while they're waiting for the asylum claim. That's kind of also weird that they can't get a work permit for the first six months. They can come in on asylum, but the federal government won't let them work for six months. They have to be here for six months and then apply for a work permit. And so no, Canada is offering those people in the US, hey, come to Canada and we'll give you a work permit right away. So it's kind of, I mean, these political <laughs> games that countries do. And I just want to point out to you, Super, we've been out here quite a while, walking along the border where anybody can walk in. And like I told you, when we get out here, it's just gonna be peaceful. All you're gonna hear is the wind blowing and the birds chirping. And this is the way it is when I bring news crews out here and where you can see 
the wall has ended along here, and you can just walk under that. Nothing holding you back. No. <laughs> and it's not like people think that it's going to be just Wild West out here, people with AK-47s, you know ripping you off and shooting you and hijacking you and stealing your car and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> I mean, that really is how it's uh, presented. I mean, they're saying that everything goes, the women are being raped. Yeah, they're all getting raped and they have their rape trees where they put their clothing up there for the trophies of the rape. And it's just sensational stuff, unfortunately sells newspapers and gets you ratings and gets you clicks, you know, clickbait, click, click, click on this story. There's certain people that are on speed dial for the mainstream networks that will always give a crisis story. And there's certain ranchers, there's pet ranchers that know I can get on Fox News every week and all my friends and family will see me. All I have to say is they'll go get some piece of cloth and they say, I found this on the ranch, and you know what it is? It's a Muslim prayer rug. <laughs> These Muslim terrorists are coming through my ranch, and if they say that, they'll get on the evening news, it'll get repeated over and over and played a bunch of times, it'll get cycled through like for weeks through the news cycle. But if I come out here and say it's peaceful, it's like, man, I wanna see a gun battle, there's nothing interesting here, you know? Like if I just come tell the truth, and they're like, hey, call me back when there's something exciting happening. So. You have, unfortunately, those politicians, like there's a sheriff in Yuma who's like that. He's got a bunch of retired older people, and it's sad to say, because I'm getting to be older, but older people are easy to scare, and people move to Arizona to retire. They didn't grow up here, and they don't know that it's actually peaceful, so it's easy for a politician to tell them, you need to be scared, you need to be very scared. You better elect me, because this is so out of control. You need to give me more money and more officers to keep you safe. You got certain politicians that'll just scare them, like the sheriff in Cochise County or Yuma County will do that. The sheriff in Pinal County, even though he's not on the border. Now the sheriff for Pima County, which is Tucson, they have a big piece of the border. He's like me, and he'll tell you the truth. You know, he'll tell you like what it's what it's really like. And I'm sad to say, you know, like I'm not anti-border patrol agent you know but the there's so many atrocities out here by border patrol just shooting people and then they never get prosecuted for it or anything like that and i think it's kind of turning into a police state where border patrol now has these rights to just pull you over and arrest you within 100 miles of the border and detain you and interrogate you uh, with no probable cause but they have authority by the supreme court that says Within 100 miles of the, of the international border, they can pull you over for no reason under what they call extended border search authority. I grew up being told, hey, this is the United States, this is America. You don't get pulled over at checkpoints where you have to show your papers in this country. That's what they have in the Soviet Union. But guess what? That's what it's turning into here. And I'm kind of surprised that Americans aren't a little more stubborn about their freedom. Hey, you know, <laughs> just let me live my life. I don't need some cop following me around, pulling me over all the time. So um, the, the, we don't like the optics of all the war zone type stuff because it hurts our economy. I mean, we're, we're not a rich county. Like we have the fourth highest unemployment rate of all counties in Arizona down here in this county. So this kind of imagery makes it look like a scary place, like a war zone, you know, all the razor wire and all that kind of stuff. So I'm opposed to that. The mayor and the city council down here are opposed to that. We do what we can to put up a friendly image, keep people coming down to escape the heat. It's cooler here than Tucson or Phoenix in the summer. Come to Nogales to escape the heat, enjoy the nice shopping and restaurants and all that stuff. During that 
whole Title 42 time, our economy really got messed up. Nobody could cross at the regular ports of entry, even people that had paperwork, that had legal visas. And all these businesses downtown here in Nogales rely on the business from Mexico, the people crossing in and shopping on this side. So during the whole COVID era, they said nobody can cross except for essential purposes. So they turned away all the regular shoppers and all these businesses downtown here, 90% of them were closed down for two years during the whole COVID era. These are school kids that are going back to Mexico. This time of day, they're getting out. A lot of them live in Mexico and they come across and they go to school in the US. You'll see them going back to Mexico. So a lot of them went bankrupt and went out of business. And it was only because the US government wouldn't let Mexicans come across to shop, but Americans could go down to Mexico and shop down there, you know? So they were saying, oh, we don't wanna have people intermingling. So we don't wanna let Mexicans come over. They might spread germs or disease. Wow. But at the same time, Americans were allowed to go to Mexico, to the beaches, Rocky Point, Wymas, Mazatlan, and there was no restrictions on their travel. So it was kind of like a weird rule that to me didn't make a lot of sense. But when that came to an end, these businesses came back to life because they just depend on Mexico. All this downtown businesses, they depend on shoppers from Mexico because the town in Mexico is 15 times bigger population than the town on this side in Arizona. They're both the same name. It's Nogales, Arizona in the United States and Nogales in the state of Sonora in Mexico. Just happens a lot more people live on that side. All these cars passing left to right in front of us are all coming from Mexico into the U.S. because the port of entry is just there to the left. Go, we can go park the car and just go walk into Mexico unless you yeah. want to see anything else downtown here. How long have you been sure? Just three years and I'm starting my campaign. It's a four year term, so I'm starting my campaign for next time, which is the, the election is next year. And there's already six guys that have filed to run. Uh -huh. So there's already six candidates. And when I ran, when I won, there was also six guys running for sheriff. So it was, uh, I thought, well, it's going to be kind of hard. But me and my wife just went out every day knocking on doors. And you met her. She would stay up old, old school campaigning. She would stay up every night to midnight writing handwritten letters to all the people <laughs> that we talk to every day. Right. And so that personal touch, like nowadays, nobody gets a letter. Everything is electronic, text message, email. So people will still come up to her in the store and hug her today. Oh, I still got your letter that you wrote wow. me. But just that, you know, shoe leather campaign knocking on thousands of doors. And we wrote lots of letters and just talked to a lot of people. Didn't rely a lot on advertising, just in-person, old-fashioned campaigning. Plus, some people knew the family because we've been here since the 1800s. There was the name recognition. So oh. I've been coming here since okay. I was a kid, you know, like with my parents shopping and coming to get haircuts and stuff. Like you see, this is all kind of a row of pharmacies right here. People come here because they don't need a, a prescription. You can get, you know, whatever you want. You're, antibiotics and stuff like that. Do you like uh, coming over also to get a feel since we are bordering each other? Oh yeah. You know, like... Uh, feel the climate, kind of? Yeah, and the people are very friendly down here, really easy to talk to, you know, not scary or anything like that. Yeah. A lot of money exchange houses down here because uh, people earn pesos down here and they exchange them for dollars so they can go shop in the U.S. I call these ones on the left, they're all money money changers. Bunch of military guys all in the back of the pickup. Machine, now we're getting to the action the now. <laughs> 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 Fighting the cartels, what they're doing, huh? Oh, man. <laughs> man, super, too bad. If you don't find any action, you're going to go home. You'll be hanging your head. <laughs> Tell the family, I saw nothing. It's just totally dead. Oh there. my God, on both sides, man. Yeah. At least on this side, it's supposed to be on and popping, man. Yeah. I'll show you. This is everybody getting going back in? Yeah. So that's that's about an hour and a half right here when it's up this far. Uh -huh. Could be two hours. Um, depends on how quick they're doing the inspections because it goes down here and all the way down that side by all the pharmacies and then goes the other way towards the pedestrian. And then the cars are lined up over there even farther. They'll be backed up for miles going back that way. So in a car, you gotta have a good 
cooling system where your car overheats sitting in line. That's some gas there. in there too, huh? Yeah. So I'm going to show you one of the, just like these curio shops that have all the all the uh, handcrafted right stuff and everything. Shout out to Kila, come here. Hello, guys, welcome to the show. No tiene las placas de vehículos de los varios estados como antes tuvieron de Hawaii, no tiene. Sí, how many you need? Déjeme ver. Let me show you. This guy always has a bunch of license plates from all the states in the U.S. If you have a state that you want the license plate from, like Wisconsin or Minnesota or something to hang on your wall, he's likely to have it. I want to show my story. Oh, okay. Mexico. How many you need? A hundred? Puro, puro Sonora. Entonces, so, so these are all for this state. Sometimes they would have for other states, like Chihuahua or no, Oaxaca no, no. or something like that. Sometimes they would have no, no. for the different different it's states, easy. like there. You yeah, know, a lot of the states down 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 south and stuff. Sometimes they would have those, but uh, now they just got like uh, the Son Sonora, which is the state. They're all Mexico, but they're just different styles. I say this one right here. Esta Sonora, mira, esta Sonora que está ahí. Este es Sonora. Sonora. México, México. México. Ese par camión, ¿no? Sí, es par camión. And this, what the purple ones, it's for the, uh, the uh, cargo trucks, like tractor trailers. They have the trailer. purple, uh, purple thing like that. How much is this? This one, this is $20. $20. Free charity. Yep. Free charity. Where do you come from? Mucho. Acá de Nogales. ¿Tú por Nogales? Ahí está la voz. Sí, desde los 1800. No. Oh, you look like, oh, you look like, like, you look like a ah, Texas. No, no. Es mentiroso que este. Ustedes puros jóvenes que no saben nada de la historia de la región. Mi familia ah. de vaqueros desde los 1800. Ah, por oh, tu familia. Yeah, yeah. ¿Qué dice que este es 1810 este? No, I'm not from here. I'm from Michoacán. Michoacán. No, no, Michigan. Like Guadalajara next door. Michigan. Oh, okay. Ponchos. Ponchos. I got yeah. Let me show you. Look at this one. This Muy. is Mexican. Yeah. Muy impresionante. Wow. Yeah. Right, yeah, no problem. And this is washable, putting the machine in cold water and not shrink. This is 100% wool. Oh, this one has a hood too, huh? Yeah, because look, buddy. See, cotton. But cotton, you know what? Cotton got shrink a half. Look Para algo así, ¿cuánto, cuánto costará algo así? This one, this is 120. So, yeah. Oh, look it. It's what are we talking? Are you talking about U.S. dollars? Yeah. Jeez. No, no. Oh, this is the cotton. That's okay, that's okay. No, I have more cheaper like this. No, no, but you said for $120? No, no, but these ones. No, no, but the different ones. I have a different one. Okay. You want to see the mask? How much you want? Mas. 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 My grandma, she's been last night, but they supposed to be helping me out here. No, throw on. Come on, man. This one is cheaper. Oh, this is the cheaper. Let me hold that up so you, you come over there. all the time, man. Hey, You're supposed that, to be. No, look. This, this guy's is, ready to work me over. No, look at this. It's part of the experience. You come know, on, no, no, man. Experience. Hey, this is the cheap kind. This is the cotton. They go shrink a half. They lose the cotton. Yeah. Yeah, like a Mexican bandido. Real one? Yeah, like Pancho Villa. You know, Pancho. <laughs> hey, Cuanto, senor? Cuanto. That one, this is 65 for you. No, because it's 85, but because you come with this guy from Nogales, 65. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and 20, that's 85 for the Holy that's, Chilada. Uh, that's too much. You know what? Oh, Here, look, a wait. Lot of work. Sir, look, give me 80 for the Holy Chilada. Yo necesito gorro por gratis. No, I don't no, have any gorros. No, no nothing. No, gratis. no, really nada. Look, no gorros, no. no. They don't want me to tell you, but there's a bunch of ones over there that have hats. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we're going to go look. Okay. Wow, he said, how much you want to spend for this one? Give me a good deal, senor. I don't have... No, oh, how much for the two? Uh... Two, two. 40. Oh, no, wow. come on, you're in Mexico, for todo. in China. You 40 for total. No, you want to rent it or you want to buy it? Uh, buy it. Yeah, no, because if you want to rent it, I'll do maybe 40, you'll bring it to tomorrow. Mira, give me 70. But no, the that's so, too much, man. No, because I do this one 50 and 20 for the for that one is 70. It's a good deal. All right, keep these together. Oh, and the then we go. The same thing, everybody, and they'll come back. Mira, here, look it. 65, okay. For the, for the uh, whole enchilada. Two. For everything, yeah, yeah, for totals, yeah. okay. Keep this because I want you to take yeah, me no, to where. Okay. Okay. Here, wait. 
I want you to take it. Give me sixty dollars for the two. I come down a lot, you know. I come down I know. twenty dollars, sixty bucks for the two. Senor, gracias for lowering the price. Yo, tienes no dinero. Pero no está hecho de oro. Tiene su criatura. Tiene los hijos y también. Yeah, for me, and over there, it's no Mira, bueno. Okay. I was telling no them bueno. about your family, you got family and everything. Yeah, my family, mi esposo, you tienes chiquito, niño, señor, por favor, 40. No? Okay, so listen, listen. Hold on to this, hold on to this, because yo te gusto mucho. Hold on to both of these, and then I go over there, and I'm going to see... And then, señor, 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 escucha, por favor. I'm going to go over there. Mira, here, don't, don't, 50 bucks, here. 50, 50, 50, 50. 50. Yeah. Okay, put it in the middle. 50, 50, 50 for Toro, 50 huh? Toro. 50 for Toro, it's no business. It's no it's business. Very slow, no, it's around, it's no business, it's very quiet. We have a week, no sales. Give me 50. 50, open the water. Let me see what I got in here. Oh, no, oh, cry, no cry like man. a Mexican. You cry like a Mexican. No cry. <laughs> Señor, no más. Entonces vamos a pasear un rato para ver los sombreros. No, no más. So Está bien, está bien. Está bien, está bien. Gracias, señor. Gracias. You don't forget my license plate. Thank you. He played with kind of a fairy. You should want to see a hat. Yeah. Just a nice cowboy hat. Oh, like a cowboy hat. Yeah. It. And they got a store over here that's got a bunch of those. Over. Yeah. How'd I do today? <laughs> it was okay. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> like, I was, right. like I was telling you, you cry like a Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have got away, Laura, huh? That's what you think. Uh, no. <laughs> so I it. was good talking about the babies and the family and the wife and the poor family. <laughs> had to pull it to heartstrings. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. I like that hat. How much for a hat like that? Let's see how that looks on you. It's pretty, pretty good, good, man. And it does have the two horses like that poncho. I told you, look at this one that matches too. It's the same. Yep. How much for a hat like this? That one is 45. Sheesh. Yeah, no. <laughs> this is the poncho via use it. That's oh. a good looking hat. It looks good with the uh, that poncho. It's like they were made for each other. They both have the, the two the horse, horses. Yeah. The horse theme and yeah. stuff. Look at all the presents and stuff. There's a radio station right there that I do a lot of interviews at, right where it says XENY. Their studios are upstairs. I do. It's probably where they're doing a promotional drive with that radio station. I think they have a thing called Cartita Sa Santa, and you can sponsor a gift for a kid. They'll they'll say that they want like a new shoes or uh, you know a, a doll or something like that. We can go ask them if that's what it and is. And that's what they're doing, huh? I'm kind of guessing it is. ¿Qué tal es de la Cartita a Santa? ¿Qué están haciendo? Okay, con el profesor Encinas, no? <laughs> Yeah, it's like, that's what they're doing, that thing, uh, Letters to Santa Claus, and then they do it over the air, and then people will call in and sponsor, a, like, a certain kid that wrote a letter, and they'll read them out over the air, and then you buy the stuff, and then you bring it in, and I guess they're loading it up to, deli to deliver them. It's kind of a neat thing. Just so you walk these streets many years, huh? Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of come down here, we would buy sugar down here and get Coca-Cola in the bottles down here, cheaper, and... Some people say the Mexican Coca-Cola tastes better because it's made out of the real sugar or something. I don't, I don't know if that's true, but we would our whole life come down here and do, buy certain kind of things, get our haircuts down here and buy. Would you come down products. with the uh, with the whole family or sometimes you just? No, just myself. My wife the same thing. When she was a kid, just walk down here to get an ice cream cone or uh, to do something. My wife worked. Uh, right along the border and there was a Walgreens right here next to this port of entry and she worked there and then I worked uh, here right near the border at a McDonald's when I was in high school. Now you see that picture coming up of a young man is where a border patrol agent through the fence shot a young man, I think he was 16, 
shot him 10 times with uh, an M4, which is basically an, an M16. And he said the kids would, the kid was throwing rocks at him. So, you know, it's kind of wow. a little bit hard to imagine. And then... Those so the retaliation, the, huh? The retaliation. And then they got... They charged the agent, but they dropped the charges, and there's a civil lawsuit, and they dropped that, too. So uh, they do have, like, a little thing once a year where the people will gather along the wall here and remember that day when that happens. Uh, and that's him right there, the kid? Yeah. Wow. Shot him 10 times. Yep. Yeah, through. So it's kind of hard to believe there'd be a threat to a Border Patrol guy up on that side where he'd need to shoot somebody in Mexico. And they're just some little poem, I guess, in, in remembrance of that kid right there. And it says, let me translate into English, it says, the strong instinct, instinct to preserve one's life uh, against hunger, violence, war, is very strong. Uh, we are the refuge for the fugitives of the whole world that have left their houses and leaving with nothing, remaining with nothing. Quedamos, quedamos sin nada. And then it says, uh, asylum in Spanish, asilo. Okay. So it's kind of a tribute to people who are seeking a better life in, a, in another country. Yeah, super. Um, this, of course, my car, patrol car, and it's, you know, it says Sheriff Hathaway, and it's got the badge on it, and here's got the words on the back. Like um, a lot of sheriffs nowadays, they'll go on an undercover plainclothes car, but I like people to know it's me, so they know I'm approachable. I'm an elected official, so I like people to be able to come talk to me. Now, here's the sheriff's office here, and we're walking in right here. There's two entrances. That's the jail on the left. It says Adult Detention Center. And this is the sheriff's office on the right here. So it kind, of, kind of a nice time of day, like sunset here. And you can see up here on the door, it says Sheriff David Hathaway there on the door. Now this lobby is, is really unique. They did this like a year ago. I got an artist from Mexico. He came and painted all this to look like an old fashioned jail. And he did an incredible job. You see like just on the bathroom doors, the wood grain there, how he painted all that. And then he made it look like there's a jail here. And you know, like here's the entry door. And he said, you know what? I'm gonna paint just the silhouette of a prisoner. So you could tell people that could be you in there. Like not a face <laughs> on it, but just kind of a silhouette. And then he actually signed the wall that right down here, Arturo. Pino, hey. when he painted it, he signed the wall right there. And my office is just down here at the end of the hall. Got my little conference room in here so I can have meetings with like the command staff, the commanders and sergeants and stuff like that. And, and here, this is my office. And this was my dad's desk when he was the county attorney. And before that, there was a sheriff in this county named J.J. Lowe, and this was his desk. And he was the sheriff from 1939 to 1958. So it's one of these old yeah. roll top type desks. So it was the sheriff in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And then it was my dad's when he was county attorney and judge. And then my mom gave it to me recently. So I just got that in there. But I have my regular modern desk over there, too. And then here's where I do um, a whole bunch of interviews. And then the NBC reporter lady, she said, you got to make yourself a VAT backdrop, and you got to get yourself a ring light. you got to get yourself one of these doodads. <laughs> this NBC reporter lady <laughs> got me set up to where I do my interviews here, and then I can just clamp the smartphone or the tablet there, and then 
extend it up to be taller, you know, and then she actually trained me to do this. Uh, before. They got you all primed up, she, man. she did, you know. So guys, this has been quite an adventure. Your boy Super was prepared for some uh, rough and tough stuff down here at the border, but that is not what we have to show. All right, well, thank you again. Well, thank you, Super. Thank you so much for coming it. down. Thank and, you for having you know, God bless you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. I hope you guys have a nice, uh, peaceful time up there in Phoenix and you enjoy the rest of the year. Yes, sir. You too, man. All right. Thank you. Thank you.